This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. Uh, this morning I have with me John Rubino, well-known author and publisher of the website dollarcollapse.com. Good morning, John, and welcome back. Morning, Gord. Great to be back. How quickly the month goes. <laughs> this was a heck of a month, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and, and every time we get together to do this, it's like we're in shock of, of the kinds of things that have happened. And this month is even bigger than ever before. Forget this month, the last week, the last couple of days. Well, you know, truth is stranger than fiction anymore. We, you know, you and I expected crazy stuff to happen. Exactly. But this is crazier than, uh, at least at this point in the cycle, crazier than we have talked about in the past. You know, nobody expected the Swiss franc thing to happen so abruptly or, you know, the Russia oil thing. All of this stuff is, uh, is, is very extreme. John, I think that it's going to get faster and more shocking because I really feel that the central banks, I I don't want to say are losing control, but they're moving from concern to a little bit of fear or anxiety, let's say that. But sometime by the spring, I think the central banks are going to realize that they're they're pushing on a, on a string. We know that, but and what and they're not going to, that doesn't mean they're going to quit. That means they're going to get even more aggressive with some of these programs, and I've got some ideas on what they're going to be, but uh, we're, it's going to be some shockers that are coming. Well, yeah, the, the important thing to understand about economic policy around the world is that it's not sustainable, and, and they, they only have one tool, which is easy money, and they have to do more and more of it over time to maintain normality in the world. And so at some point they run out of the ability to create more currency and, and monetize more debt. You know, the, the amount of debt that is required for that becomes overwhelming and the system spins out of control. And we're, we're seeing the early stages of that now, you know, all kinds of crazy volatility has been springing up in places where, where nobody expected it ahead of time around the world. And so, yeah, you're, you're right. The central banks of the world are starting to lose control of the process. Yeah, and, and, and where it heads from here. And I yeah. think they're really starting to recognize it, uh, whereas before, um, I don't think they fully understood it. But anyway, John, let, there's so many things to talk about. I got a list here of, of just four areas that I'd like to just step through and get your views on them. And if possible, try and, is there something bigger going on here? How are they connected? Is there some commonality or are these just random events. Uh, let's start with what just happened. We knew that the Drahi, long overdue, it was going to come out with some form of, of uh, quantitative easing. He announced it. What's it mean? Uh, what's really going on here? Well, Europe has been drifting into um, this deflationary vortex for a long time. And, uh, you know, if it was the U.S., obviously, we, we went for it right away. We started monetizing our debt, uh, you know, as soon as the crisis hit. And Europe has more of a problem because the, uh, the Eurozone is structured very differently from the U.S. They're, they're not a unified government with one federal debt. They've got... Um, how, what is it, 17 countries now, each with their own national budgets and their own national debt, and uh, one monetary system trying to pull all of them together. And, and they've got Germany, uh, which has, uh, you know, a cultural memory of hyperinflation. So they're terrified of the, uh, the impact of debt monetization. So it's taken Europe a long time and a lot of turmoil to get to the point where they're finally desperate enough to start monetizing debt on a, on a QE scale. And what it has taken is uh, the rise of political parties um, across the Eurozone periphery that are anti-Euro. Uh, you know, Greece is going to elect somebody shortly who would be completely happy to leave the Eurozone. Italy, same thing. Um, you know, France, uh, the National Front in France is, uh, is leading in polls, and they would, they would go back to the franc in a heartbeat if they uh, took over and had the kind of power to make that happen. So the Eurozone is, is in danger of 
breaking apart. And it's also in danger of dropping into uh, deflation, which is a disaster for an over indebted economy. You know, deflation is, is a sign of a healthy economy in normal times. Uh, because you get more productive and things get cheaper because you're better at building things. Well, in, in an over-indebted society, um, deflation makes debts harder to manage and pushes you further and further into a hole. Europe's in that in danger of that happening. So finally, they've decided to bite the bullet and start monetizing debt. And, and that's what all of this means. Now, it's not going to work, obviously, because it hasn't worked for anybody so far. And what will happen is um, they'll get a little respite from a weaker currency. Basically, the euro is tanking right now it's, in it's, anticipation it's going, it's going down like the yen went down yes yeah and, and, and see that i think we're trading this morning like 112 we knew you and i talked about we felt it was going to 115 oh a year year and a half ago and right now i think parity is is a strong possibility yeah yeah and that's that's just another front in the currency war it, it goes back and forth in the early stage when one country will weaken its currency via really aggressive monetary policy and that was us for the last uh, the three years prior to the last two and so japan and europe as the losers in in that stage of the uh, the currency war found themselves dropping into um, deflationary recession because their currencies were too strong well now they have out of desperation, had to really aggressively start buying back debt and force the value of their currencies down. And now it, it's going to help them. You know, a, a weaker currency helps your exporters. It pumps up that side of the economy, at least. Uh, and, and both Europe and Japan are seeing that in the early stages right now. But that comes at our expense. So we're going to be the, uh, the surprise slowdown of the next couple of years because our currency is too strong. And so, you know, by the end of this year, or certainly in, in 2016, we will, if nothing else happens, you know, if the global financial system doesn't fall apart by then, we will have to be aggressively monetizing debt again. And this is going to go on until these fiat currencies don't work anymore, until people figure out that uh, that it's all meaningless, it's all just play money, and nobody is managing their currencies prudently uh, in a way that will cause them to maintain their value over time. Everybody's aggressively making their currencies worth less and less over time. And so, you know, the point is coming when, when everybody figures that out and doesn't want to hold those currencies anymore. And you see that in the behavior of gold in the crisis economies. You know, in Russia, gold, the, the ruble gold price spiked, and it just happened in euros here, where, where gold is, uh, you know, sort of, it's up a little in the US. We don't really feel like it's a bull market yet. But in Europe, it's up aggressively, re really big, like 20 some percent in the last couple of months. And the reason for that is that people are losing faith in the euro, at least in the short run. Well, we will see that around the world one of these days. Well, at the um... I was going to say the Swiss certainly lost confidence, but I in the euro. But that's not really what happened. But but just a point before we move into the Swiss franc, John, you know the old, the old beggar thy neighbor currency wars drive down your currency to get yourself an export competitive advantage is a, is a classic. The the twist in it this well many twists, but one of the twists is is the carry trade has pumped nine trillion dollars out of out of low cost money in the United States into these emerging markets, et cetera, around the world which has brought supply forward, which creates this hole behind it, unless you can increase demand. But now they have to pay back the debt in smaller currencies because their currency is weakening. So they get a competitive advantage, but suddenly that's what's driving the U.S. dollar in my mind is, is hedging and, and margin cover and covering because they borrowed expecting the U.S. dollar to fall as they funded, their, as they funded a lot of that debt. Uh, Telegram was saying they think it's close to $6 trillion that actually went into emerging markets alone, but it, it's substantial. So it's a catch-22 there. Yeah, yeah. Around the world, um, people have been borrowing in dollars. Right, exactly. And it, see, that, that's basically taking a short position in the dollar when you do that, because uh, you benefit if dollars go down in value because you're paying back cheaper currency. Well, now, well, and, now, and that also... Now if we get to Switzerland, John, People were doing the same thing with the Swiss franc. We're, look what happened in Poland, Central Eastern Europe. <laughs> they were borrowing a Swiss franc. It was pegged. So if in any, anything, it wasn't, you know, it was going to be held down. So they were doing it and they were secure. Now, all of a sudden, boom, they're on the, they're in trouble. Ever mind Switzerland. 
Yeah, yeah. Switzerland is a small country, but this is a very big story because this is the first central bank to opt out of the currency war. Basically, they surrendered and, and they're, they're paying a price for it. You know, it's not it's not clear that you can surrender in a currency war yet. That's the question that's going to be answered by Switzerland, because your, your export industries are hurt very badly if your currency soars in price, which is what happens if you decide not to monetize your debt along with the uh, the inflationary countries. So Switzerland decided to break its peg with the euro because it, it uh, in order to keep the Swiss franc stable with the euro, it was having to buy huge amounts of euros. And so its balance sheet, the, the Swiss national bank balance sheet was soaring. They were issuing huge numbers of uh, Swiss franc and using it to buy lots of euros, which was an increasingly bad deal for them. So they finally bit the bullet, took the loss on, on the euros that they had bought up to this point and allowed their currency to soar. Now, two things. One is, we'll, we'll see if that's possible, if Switzerland's economy manages to uh, exist in a weak currency world with a strong currency. And the second thing is, it shook the confidence of the world in central banks. All of a sudden, you've got this major central bank that had made a promise, a public promise just a few days earlier, and then just backed out, just broke its promise. And so does that cause the rest of the world to look at the promises of the other central banks around the world and also question them? You know, that, that's a, uh, um, a piece of the foundation of the current myth structure of the, the global economy, that central banks are all powerful and, and can be trusted. It really begs, you take that away. Johnny, John, it really begs the question, why was it so sudden? There's no inkling, no warning. It was like it was suddenly one night, 24 hours, 48 hours, they decided without any warning. And remember, they just fought a referendum not to buy gold to be able to keep this in, or to put it in place so they could protect exports and protect jobs in Switzerland. This is exactly the opposite of what the referendum was about. Yes. <laughs> so, and that was what, 30 days ago? 30 so, days ago. So yeah. it, it, at a minimum, without trying to make sense out of it, it says they truly have lost control. That's got to be yeah, a thousand yeah. And I think this well, is the, only the first of pegs that's going to fold. Because we yeah, saw the well, well, fold, more or less. I think Hong Kong, Den, Den, there's some problems in Denmark right now with their peg, etc. Well, Denmark just promised that they would maintain their peg. So we, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you, you, um, you said something a second ago about making sense of the situation. And that's, that's the crucial point in all this, that, that it won't make sense when things really get going. You know, you, you, you'll have really erratic behavior on the part of these guys who used to think they were in charge and now find uh, circumstances just spinning out of control. And they're, they're going to start doing things that seem to make no sense because they're, they're just people under pressure and they're, they're used to having almost unlimited power and they're, they're gradually finding out that they actually aren't in control of events. And so you're gonna see all kinds of bizarre behavior like Swiss national banks. And that, that was very bizarre for a lot of reasons. One, because as you said, they promised just a few days ago that they were gonna, a few days before that they were gonna manage their peg um, as they um, had, had said they would over time. You know, they weren't going to break it. They were going to keep the euro at, at 1.2 uh, or keep the, um, the Swiss franc at 1.2 euros um, forever. And then three days later, they, they just abandoned it. So this, and is, a, they also, this is a shock they, they, wave that's going through the world. Yeah, and you know, they, and they did it on a Thursday. That, that's a very important thing because normally big announcements happen over the weekend to give the markets time to uh, digest them. And also uh, because a lot of people close positions uh, um, on Friday, they didn't want to go through the weekend with open foreign exchange positions. And so had they done it over the weekend, uh, there would have been a, a lot less damage to the hedge fund community out there. But instead, they did it while the markets were open. And so there were a lot of hedge funds with really big Swiss franc positions uh, that were just crushed by this. You know, some, some hedge funds just vaporized. They just went out of business. And a lot of foreign exchange traders um, couldn't manage the order flow because the, the Swiss franc spiked so quickly that they were also hurt really badly. So uh, the, the, uh, the Swiss National Bank you would almost think they were doing this to hurt the leveraged speculating community. And, uh, it, you know, it's not clear why they would want to do that. But, 
you know, it looks like there there was volition behind this, that they actually thought it through and that that was one of their points. And I think, so I think there was just 20 billion dollars dollars to be saved by front running the ECB announcement that they knew was finally going to actually happen with quantitative yeah. easing. And you saw the euro and as, as we talk now, continuing to go down. So they've saved out of money they would have had to spend to try and shore up the currency in their that, now whether they reverse I don't know I don't know but yeah. but uh, clearly that I think that I think it was just complete total knee jerk. Well, and that could be it. Finally, they just said, "Look, we can't take it anymore. Just close it down," you know. And and they did it on a Thursday when um, instead of waiting through Friday and buying more euros on Friday, yeah, who knows? Their but debt, the debt to GDP of the central bank is the second only second largest in the world. I mean, yes. for a little, a little country, it's on the hairy edge. And, you know, John, the, these ripple waves that are going through, because I want to talk about energy here, which is another shocker that we, it's, it sounds like it's old news. God, I mean, it's 30, 60 days old now, but these waves are still washing ashore. But if you look at the currencies and, and these pegs that are in trouble, I, uh, we all know that the yen has plummeted in relationship to the U.S. dollars as, as, with, with economics. But have you looked at the yuan versus the yen? And so what's happened is the one that's the remimbi has tried to rel be relative to the U.S., but it still was strengthening. It is in complete free fall and in that relationship. So how long before the Chinese say, I can't afford to give the Japanese this kind of competitive advantage on currencies? They're, now, what a, that, now that's an elephant if it starts to do something to protect its currency. Yeah, um, China would That's be a big scary. deal. But if they decided to join the currency war and, and uh, aggressively devalue the yuan, that would be an earthquake. And well, uh, it's coming. You know, at some point they have to do it. The president says, my goal is not growth. My goal is 10 million new jobs a year. Mm -hmm. And with manufacturing, automation, et cetera, going on, that's 10 net new million jobs a year. Uh, that's that's a big chin up. See, it, it, and you don't and you don't do that with a stronger currency with demand slowing. It's important to understand that everybody has something that's more important than the value of their currency that they've got to deal with. In Europe, it's it's deflation. Same thing in Japan. You know, their their um, their economies are starting to contract at a time when they have so much debt that they can't afford a, a contraction. So that you know, stopping that, reversing it, is way more important than the value of their currency. China has an awful lot of people they've got to placate with good jobs and they have a history of, of not hyperinflation but political instability and so that's what they're terrified of you know unlike germany that's afraid of inflation china is af afraid of um, a million people hitting the streets and tearing down the government because that has happened in living memory in china yeah they hold the government responsible for creating and supplying jobs mm -hmm. And that's the price tag, that, and that's number one priority. Yeah. And oh, that those are major chin-ups. You know, I live in Boston, and you know to think that ten million jobs, our pop, you know, five hundred thousand people <laughs> running around here. I mean, how many? That's, that's a whole state of Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Per year. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not, what what move, John? We're going to be short of sure. time. Energy. What does this energy shocker mean? What are you seeing coming out of it? Well, this this is another thing that just came out of the blue, huh? And you know, there there are right. different reasons for it that have been thrown out there. One is geopolitical. We we um, saw Vladimir Putin in Russia as a threat and decided to take him down a peg. So we cut a deal with Saudi Arabia for them to pump up production and, and uh, the oil price plunged, which hurts Russia more than anybody else. Okay, that's one story. And another is that the global economy is slowing dramatically behind the scenes. You know, the numbers that are being um, reported by governments don't really indicate the, the true extent of a slowdown, especially in China, but also Europe and Japan and to an extent the US. And so we're using less oil, which makes the price go down. So whatever the reason, and we're also of course producing a huge amount of new oil in the US with fracking and, and shale oil. And, and so the combination of these factors has sent oil down by like 60% in the last couple of months. and. It turns out that especially in the U.S., um, billions and billions of dollars of junk bonds have been written um, in order to fund increases in very expensive oil production. 
And so that was the source of the full-time jobs in the recovery of the past five years. We've been hiring a lot of people in the, the oil patch, paying them good money, whereas basically everybody else who's gotten a job in, uh, in five years has gotten it at McDonald's or as a corporate temp or something that nobody in, the, in their right minds wants to do. You do it because you have to and you can't support a family uh, with that kind of a job. Those oil patch jobs were, were good paying jobs that, uh, that let people live middle class lives. Well, that's over now. And it's being reversed out. Uh, the number of rigs in uh, in the Bakken oil field is plunging, and Texas is going to lose a uh, hundred and some thousand jobs in the coming year, apparently. And so the employment gains in the last few years of this recovery are going to be reversed out dramatically and quickly. And so that's just one big impact. You know, you got the junk bond implosion in, in the oil patch, and you've got jobs disappearing. So, so the energy thing is a big deal. And at, at the same time, though, you've got um, lower commuting costs for middle class people, which is, an, in a way, a nice um, redistribution of wealth away from the financial sector and towards actual real people. So that, in that sense, it's okay. But I think the uh, the economic impact is going to be more serious. Uh, than the benefits. So we're going to be hurt on balance by falling oil prices. And it's possible that um, the, the oil patch junk bonds become kind of the, uh, the subprime mortgages of this bubble, where that's the thing that pops first and spreads to the rest of the economy and causes a full-fledged financial crisis. We will see, but uh, the, the numbers are fairly comparable and the situation is fairly comparable. You know, we've had a few years of recovery in which we've taken on a lot of new debt and, and there are insane amounts of derivatives out there that are tied to things like interest rates and energy prices and and, uh, and currency values that uh, with the current volatility, uh, a lot of which are underwater. And so we'll see who blows up as a result of all this volatility. John, you know, I think what people are somewhat underestimating is with the oil prices dropping as dramatically it has, the OPEC and non-OPEC countries how dependent their budgets are on those revenues. And matter of fact, they are now in serious deficits in a vast majority of the countries with these current oil prices. At $70 a barrel, it was close to, including non-OPEC, of half a trillion dollars of immediate lost revenue on an annualized basis. It's significantly higher than that now. And, and that's revenue that they're going to have to make up to keep their economies stable, which means they're going to be selling assets to be able to keep their budget going unless it balances. Pull that liquidity out of the asset markets. That's, that's, that's taper in a hurry. Oh, yeah, yeah. In reverse, I, I, reverse. So that's sitting there, and, that's real, and nobody's talking about it yet. But that's, well, liqu that's a liquidity problem. I, illustrating how many moving parts there are in this story. And then, by the well, way, most the, of these... the, the king, king of Saudi Arabia just died, right? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to mix it up. So we might have a little bit of infighting of policy priorities. Here. Yeah, who knows about that? But, but you know, most of these guys have run trade surpluses yes. with the U.S., which means they've got big dollar balances, which means those balances went way up in value just lately. So they've got some uh, appreciated assets they can cash out if they need to in the form of their treasury bonds. But, but the, so they, they've got a little cushion. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, they, they have to get the money from somewhere if they're going to run uh, – you know, deficits equal to 40% of their GDP, which a lot of these guys are looking at. You know, it's, it's a huge shift in um, national income for these countries. And so, you know, the, the, the key to all of this is one word, volatility. There, there are really fast, really dramatic changes coming almost everywhere. We're seeing and, gold. Uh, our last thing on our list was gold. Yes. What, and what does it mean there? And is that a signal of this coming volatility, et cetera? Yeah, um, gold is a crucial part of this story too, because you're finally seeing all this volatility, all this volatility scare people back into the safest asset, which is gold. You know, and, and you see it most clearly in the countries that are having immediate currency crises where gold spikes in, in Russian rubles or euros or whatever. And so, so we're getting a glimpse of how gold performs during a currency crisis. And as the, the fear that central banks are untrustworthy spreads around the world, you, you got to figure that gold is going to be a beneficiary of that. 
And so no guarantee when that happens, but it's a glimpse of the future right now, what we're seeing in Russia and the Eurozone. And it's interesting, in Russia, uh, Putin has decided he's selling reserves, but he's not selling his gold. No, so, no. And, and that's his, you know, that was a good deal for him. He, he bought a ton of gold or, or many, many tons of gold in the last few years, and it's way up. Yeah, and I've noticed that even though he's short, he's still buying more. He's still buying gold. I don't know where he's getting the money, but he's still buying more. So <laughs> he's using yeah. all those dollars that he has as well. <laughs> you know, he's he's a smart man in in some ways. I don't know if he's got himself in a box, but time will tell. Now, John, we we're up, we're up against a hard line. John, can you make some sense of the chaos here? Is there a common theme or a common thread that link these things together? Well, yeah, the, the common thread that links everything together is that um, when you borrow too much money, your life spins out of control. And the whole world has spent the last 30 or 40 years borrowing too much money. So we shouldn't be surprised that all these seemingly unrelated crises are bubbling up at the same time because they can all be tied back to somebody borrowing too much money for something that they shouldn't have done in the first place because money was too easy. And so we should expect to see more of this in the future. And, um, you know, there's no way to predict the time frame in which all of this plays out because um, we're, we're dealing with people under pressure who are used to having unlimited power and finding out that they, and they're now finding out that they don't really have any control over events, but they still have to make decisions. So, so these are going to be a lot of irrational decisions made and they're going to be very hard to predict, but they're, they're all going to tend towards volatility and chaos because that's what happens when you owe too much money and and so um the end game of course is everybody losing faith in the system and running to various kinds of safe havens so right now the dollar is the big beneficiary of that and gold is also to an extent a beneficiary of that along with the the swiss franc unfortunately for the swiss and but we'll see that spread around the world and uh, I, I think in the end we're going to see gold be the major beneficiary because the dollar is going to be a victim of this same process. Uh, it's just going to take a little longer because we are the the least ugly situation in the world right now. And uh, that won't last because we are ugly. You know, we are over indebted. We are mismanaged and, and eventually we'll pay a price for it. Uh, but it might be a little while. You know, it might be uh, another um, few months of extreme dollar strength before it becomes overwhelming to us and we have to uh, join the quantitative easing party again and then yeah. then who knows then there's nobody left <laughs> like so I, I think at that of, point like ring around yeah the well just, we just keep rotating around the circle but i think that circle's getting tighter and tighter i think they kind of call that a bit of a death spiral but you know john i don't know if you recall when i wrote the, 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 our paper the globalization trap two years ago and in it, we argued that what was what was unfolding here with quantitative easing is you make things you when you drive down, drive down interest rates, consumers can buy more, they can finance more, they can take on the more debt, which they do. So demand is up. Conversely, suppliers can then increase factory in, like emerging markets to fill that supply demand. So you got higher out demand, higher supply. But what you've done is you've really brought it all forward from the future. You've brought it up on these cheaper rates. And that's fine, but eventually it reaches an equilibrium. It may take a year, may take 18 months, but it's a, and when they happen to, when equilibrium is reached, the run rate for that supply and demand is way too high and there's a, desk, a hole on the other side that's huge. And the only way you can offset that is exponentially grow the credit again to get over that, that hump and bring it. It's only a matter of time. But because you can't increase it, what happens is the inflation is there, so real disposable income starts to shrink. So demand falls off, never mind the hole I just mentioned. When it starts to fall off, commodity prices suddenly will fall. Is that not what's happening? And we, saw, we thought that was out a year, year and a half. And what happens when commodity prices start to fall, it's the bedrock for the credit, loans, and leverage. It's collateral. It's one of the major underpinnings for collateral. You saw it in the energy industry, being able to borrow, why they could take on such high levels of, of debt, et cetera. And that's when the implosion starts to unfold. And printing more money stops being an answer. Yeah. That, that's what we yeah. concluded. But how long is that runway? That was the question. Yeah, because uh, right now, 
the debts of the world are not that onerous because interest rates are incredibly low. And interest rates are incredibly low because most currencies are generally still accepted as money. So all of this can change when people lose faith in, in the ability of central banks to maintain a reasonable purchasing power for their money. Uh, and, and so that's kind of a theoretical idea, but it's going to play out in the real world in the not too distant future. And so at that point, yeah, the, the world won't be able to keep demand growing via new borrowing. And so all this overcapacity, which is already biting, it will just cause the system to implode. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I, I God, think, Lord, I, think, I don't know. I, I yeah. think we're we're there, but but I don't believe for a moment that something imminent. I think the volatility. Don't underestimate politicians and central bankers' ability to do things that will defy logic. Helicopter money, pumping the money straight, bypassing the banks. There's all sorts of things that will. A few years ago, we thought this was unimaginable. And now we mm -hmm. take, now we're getting so used to it. What what's it going to be like in a year and a half before all this kind of finally comes home to roost? But as, as yeah. you know, John, hyperinflation is where people lose confidence in the currency. Yes. And uh, so that when that starts to happen, man, I've always believed the U.S. dollar is the worst, but would be the last to fall. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, you know, you're right. They've got they've got the tools in the form of these yes. um, currencies that they can create in unlimited quantities to keep the game going for a while because people still trust the currencies. So it comes down to the trust that uh, that society has in our ability to manage our money. And when that goes, everything else falls apart until that time you get increasing volatility, um, but not a not a complete systemic collapse. So that's where we are now. And the end game is is a loss of faith in the currency and a complete collapse. But who knows how many months or years there are between here and there? You know, that's what we can't predict. John, we have to break. Uh, uh, can you tell our listeners how they could find out more about uh, your work, your writings, etc.? Yeah, I run dollarcollapse.com, which uh, is, a, is a site that's continuously updated with the stuff that we talked about today. And my latest book is The Money Bubble, co-written with Gold Money's James Turk. It's available on Amazon and any other electronic bookstore. We'll talk again next month. And I'm sure there's not a th one of the things we can anticipate we'll be talking about. <laughs> talk to you next month. Thanks, Gordon. Bye, See you then. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at gordontlong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com. <laughs>